Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Ways episode 4. You're here today with your ATOs in chief, Sakeep Fernando, that's me, and Tim Wilms. Hi oh. Tim. Hello. So it's actually our first interview episode where we interview people who are, you know, doing their bit to fight the battles against the enemies of freedom. You know, and we will ask them about their background and what they do and how they're making an impact. So today we are joined by YouTuber Independent Man, and he is Australian. And so hi, hi Indy. Hey guys, how you doing? So with over 13,000 subscribers, Indy, tell us more. What is your work background and how did you like come about making YouTube videos? Um... Yeah, um, I, I'm 42 years of age, so I'm halfway through my life, and I thought that uh, maybe now's a good time to do something I really believe in um, rather than just taking another job. But if, if I go back, um, I graduated uh, university in 1995 with a Bachelor of Business Accounting Economics, probably the most <laughs> dry and boring yeah. um, background you could possibly imagine. That's um, what I did and so right. So I came out, actually, when I started university, it was a pretty bad recession in Australia, the last one we had. And um, But by the time I came out, uh, the economy was doing quite well, 1995, and there was plenty of jobs. Um, I went into an accounting job, had a couple of those, really boring, didn't like it, ended up getting into stockbroking, um, enjoyed that quite a bit, and stayed in there till. 2001 and worked my way up the ladder there and but kind of quit um, at the age of 27 just as I was kind of making it if you like um, and I went off to Asia um, to teach English um, oh. earning 10 grand a year um, and I, I did that for a little over a year in Thailand and then I got an opportunity to go and teach at university in Japan and then I ended up in Japan for 13 years, basically teaching at universities. And then I became a director of a learning center on a university campus uh, in the south of uh, Japan. So I did that for six years, 13 altogether. Came back to Australia in um, February of this year with the, with the express intention of not getting a job, but uh, actually trying to um start this youtube channel and build it up into something so yeah i mean it's been um i actually put out my first video on the 30th of march so i've been doing this just over seven months um and the response is the response has been pretty good i think um yeah 13 and a half thousand subs so that's not bad in seven months i think it's yeah it's reasonable very impressive yeah yeah it's, uh, have been you have been featured in other live streams from other YouTubers as well, so that's that's mm. quite a big achievement. Yeah, um, I was lucky enough to get some support from people like um, Dave Cullen. I was actually on a live stream with Dave Cullen last night. Dave Cullen is um, computing forever. People might know who he is. I think he's probably got about one hundred and seventy thousand subs. A very popular channel, um, and yeah, he. So it, it helps when you get that push along from people who have big subscriber bases and um i also got you guys probably know bearing oh um, yes yeah he, yeah we do. he, he uh, promoted me early on and so did uh, gary awesome i think uh, if you haven't heard of him you should check him out as well uh, we're, uh, really. we're, we're learning about a lot of great youtubers at the moment so that we're we're becoming more informed hmm. it's a pretty supportive uh I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I want to use the word community, but there's, you know, there's a lot of like-minded people trying to push back against, you know, if you just call it anti-social justice, anti-feminism, anti-political correctness. There's a lot of people out there doing it, and uh, yeah, I think it's important. It's, it's pretty rewarding um, to see your channel grow and 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 get a lot of positive feedback. Yeah, why do you think that um, there has been this explosion of uh, anti-politically correctness, anti-social justice for your YouTube videos? Because there's obviously a lot of them and they're, they're all quite popular. Mm. Well, I think it has a lot to do with the fact that where else can you see it? Because if you look at the mainstream media, and uh, obviously we're here in Australia, but I mean, 
what from what I gather, it's pretty much the same in, say, the UK, Canada, the United States. That the narrative that's run with in the in, in the media, the mainstream media, um, with you know the possible exceptions of uh, in Australia, uh, papers like the Australian or the Daily Telegraph, which are obviously Murdoch owned, um, but with those ex- without those. Excluding those, I mean, the narrative is pretty much very left-wing. Um, uh, you know, they're, they're all on board with social justice, diversity, um, giving voice to minorities, which is just another way of being racist against white people. Um, yeah. uh, all of these social justice causes, feminism in particular, I mean, it just gets a free ride. No one challenges it. They just accept it. I mean, the, you know, my situation, so I've been away from Australia for 13 years. And it wasn't like this when I left. Now, uh, I've been watching this social justice phenomenon for about, I guess, about five years now on YouTube. But I was living in Japan, so I was pretty much uh, out of the environment of Australia. And I was watching it from afar. And, of course, most of the things I was watching coming through YouTube were from the United States, from the UK, some from Canada. And you don't really hear that much about Australia, although you're starting to because we've, we've really cranked up the crazy dial here in Australia. Um, and so I had this maybe naive conception that um, that if when I came back to Australia that we would be kind of, we wouldn't be infected by this somehow, you know, it wouldn't have caught on over here. But how wrong I was. Um, uh, it is, yeah. I mean, I don't know how old you guys are, but I'm assuming you're in your 20s. Yeah, you? we're, we're relatively young. Well, yeah, uh, I'm a bit older. So Sukith is oh, still a teenager, so. <laughs> yeah, well, see, the, 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 I don't know how much you want to go back into my background, but I'm, I'm born in 1974, so I don't remember um, Gough Whitlam getting booted out by Kurt. But, so my the first prime minister I remember is Malcolm Fraser as, as a kid, you know, when you got along oh, yeah. the na- national anthem and you, you know who your prime minister is. Now, in 1983, he got kicked out by um, Bob Hawke, the Hawke government. And Hawke was very popular. And as someone who comes from a working-class background, this was a big deal for working-class people. Bob Hawke represented the working class. Um, he was, he was a classical Aussie larrikin. Yes, and, and Malcolm Fraser was the sort of the toff, you know, the private school toff. Um, <laughs> and then and that's how it was seen. He was – you go back and just listen to the way Bob Hawke spoke and listen to the way Malcolm Fraser spoke. Um, now that's it's a caricature. It doesn't do justice to Malcolm Fraser, but that was that was how it was seen. Working class. I came from working class. I went to a public school, and it was a big deal that Bob Hawke came in. Now that government, Hawke, right through, and when Keating took over, and then they got you know they were in power for thirteen years. Now they did a lot of progressive, and I mean progressive in the good sense. I mean, what this is a, yeah, what it used to mean exactly. So. I mean, they did things like they floated the exchange rate. They brought down tariff barriers. They private, they you know privatized. Um, they they also did social things like Medicare and then superannuation. Um, they had, but they they weakened the power of unions to an extent by with their accord wage system, um, um, collective bargaining. You know, this was uh, it was a compromise that that they had to get from the the unions because you have to remember. I mean. Back before the 80s, I mean, we were really a bit of a backwater in Australia, just sort of piggybacking off our natural resources and our wool, wheat and and mining. And um, the Labor government was really progressive. And on the other side of the world, you had Thatcher and Reagan, who, you know, you could loosely call neoconservatives. But our Labor government, which was of the left, was doing a lot of the same things they were doing, bringing down tariffs, cutting taxes you know, privatizing industry, um, is subjecting them to competition. And this, you know, this was truly progressive. And, but um, the reason I'm saying all this is because I voted Labor. When, when I was 18, um, uh, I was able to vote for Paul Keating, I think it was, well, maybe I was 19, 1993. Yeah. It was, I think it was, it was around my 19th birthday. Um, I voted for Paul Keating. I voted for Labor. I was a Labor, I was a Labor guy because, you know, they had, they had, a lot of success behind them. Um, I think it was, who did he beat? Houston. It was a fight back package. Yeah. 
Um, now, you fast forward to today's Labor government, and today's Labor government doesn't resemble anything like the Wolf and Keating. It is so far to the left. I mean, the, the middle of the road Labor government is, um, is I would have uh, characterized as extreme left in the 80s. And now the, the extreme left is now the Greens, who are just completely off the reservation. Um, and so I have, you have the situation here where when I look at Malcolm Turnbull, he's, he's no further to the right than Paul Keating was. Um, at all. I mean, th this is how far I think the political spectrum has shifted to the left. And I think um, that's true also in the United States. I mean, to some certain extent, you've, I felt like the conservatives have given up in, in, in the United States under Obama. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's, a, well, it's a worldwide phenomenon. Well, <coughs> uh, a left, uh, well, a Western world uh, uh, phenomenon, this shift to the left and progressivism. Yeah, I mean, and yeah, it progressivism. I mean, we we really should call it regressivism. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's a good word. <laughs> yeah, and that's I think where the regressive left comes from. I mean, they really yeah. truly are regressive. Um, and I think uh, Mark Latham has characterised. I mean, now Mark Latham, Mark Latham probably represents the end of the Keating era in the Labor Party. I think he walked away in two thousand and four, perhaps. Now he he sat at the knee of Paul Keating and and he imbibed all those rules about letting the private sector cutting away as much um, regulation and red tape as you can, letting the private sector have a go at it, whilst also keeping safety nets around. Um, he believed in that. He believed in that. So we we don't have a Labor Party that believes in that. We have a Labor Party that's beholden to unions. They believe in big government. I mean, this is this is 1960s, 1950s stuff. They believe in big government solutions. And you just don't have to look at their um, proposals for uh, the last election. Um, they believe in big government spending and they don't believe in cutting taxes for the private sector. And they, they believe in throwing more welfare at people who already get too much welfare. Um, it's, it's really a horrible state of affairs. And I don't, someone, see, I feel like the country's values have shifted, but mine haven't. And so naturally, I now end up right of centre. Uh, that's where my politics are, Be and not because I've changed any principles, but because the country has shifted. Sorry for that long rant. No, that's okay. That's, 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 that, that's really interesting, I think, because um, cause I, am, I am quite surprised at your description of the Labour Party in your time, mm. because yeah. today it's very, it's practically socialist today. Y yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, and you, you only, look, go back, Go back and see, have a look at the Keating government's record, what they did. I mean, they did a lot of really progressive things. They brought this country to be a competitive, you know, global country in terms of trade, in terms of competitiveness. And, of course, we have things that should never have gone on, like the car industry should have died 10 or 15 years ago. We've been, you know, South Australia is just sort of a basket case um, state, really. But... All in all, I mean, they really made Australia a competitive country. And I think this is unfortunate with a millennial generation is that they don't understand what standards of living were like 40 years ago when I was a kid and what they are today. I mean, Australia has an unbelievable amount of prosperity in the last 30 or 40 years. And um, really has. Yeah, I like grew up as John Howard as Prime Minister and certainly we took, well, the uh, economic growth that happened during his time for for granted, and it's only after mm. he was voted out and we got Rudd Gillard uh, mm. spending like there was no tomorrow and introducing you know, all these new intrusions in uh, in business and also also in our social lives as well that we really sort of mm. reflected and say, wow, you know, we were we, we were quite lucky in the past. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, and a lot of what Howard um, accomplished was because the Labor Party had set the groundwork before. Yeah. I mean, really, Labor, uh, Howard and Costello came in, I mean, we had, the 80s and 90s were punctuated by some really overheated inflation and markets. Uh, the 90s recession in Australia was pretty bad compared to the rest of the world. It wasn't so bad in somewhere like the United States. 
And um, you come out, like Howard gets elected in 96, and you've got a nice growth rate going and unemployment come down and you have low inflation. And, you know, Howard and Costello were able to ride that for, you know, a good decade. Um, they didn't really have to do, they didn't have to tinker too much with things because it was set up. Um, I'm not saying it's all Labor's to all, all to Labor's credit, but the groundwork was laid and it seems that since, yeah, about that Rudd era, we just seem to be ripping it, ripping it up and destroying it. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's cert- yeah, certainly, um, yeah, it's cert- Australia has changed quite a bit, which is obviously why you decided to start your your U- YouTube YouTube channel. So you felt that the, the feedback and experience of posting videos is your you're making you're making a difference you feel um yeah i don't know because you have to be careful about um sort of talking into an echo chain but i know when i put a video up criticizing feminism now i know that that's going to get a 90 95 percent approval rating straight off the bat people are going to agree with it and so you end up it's to some extent you're talking to people who you already agree with and which is fine because it, you're bringing them new information that they can use hopefully I, I do a lot of sort of statistical based stuff and try and make arguments about facts rather than rhetoric but um, <clears throat> if it's not getting outside that circle uh, there's a problem but I think you know in I, I'm trying to be more because I think the only way to attack activists is to be more activist um, I think that that's what you have to do and I think for example the if I can say my influence on something like the red pill which was is the documentaries just to get a few more people to sign that petition you know yeah, if I can have topic, yeah if I can have that kind of effect um, then that, that's a positive effect I think because these things really need to be pushed back and pushed back really hard they need they have been bullying and pushing and silencing people for a long time, and we need to do it back. Um, so I think if I can have an influence in that kind of way, then then uh, I think it's positive, yeah. Yeah, because uh, it's funny you mentioned the echo chamber because one of the reasons why we started started the Unshackled is because rather than just complain in a in an echo chamber let's get our let, let's get our voices you know out into the the whole wide web and and uh, just see if we can we can we can make a difference yeah, uh, in the real world mm. yeah and i think it's important that especially with people your age because i feel like um it, that that's where the pushback has to come from ultimately is younger people uh that that this intrusion and incursion into everybody's private lives, social lives, what's going on in Canada now where they're trying to regulate how you must speak to transgender people or, you you know, it'll be a hate crime if you don't use the right pronouns. I mean, this is, this is all, this is 1984. I mean, 1984 was a warning, not a fucking rule book, playbook for the uh, SJWs, uh, but that's where they seem to be using it. It's dangerous stuff. Yeah. Is YouTube something you'd like to do full time? Um, yeah, I mean, so I, as, as I said, I've been at it seven months and, and I'm not bored. But that's, that's a problem I've had through my life is I get bored of things easily. I'm not bored. I'm enjoying it. Um, I feel like I'm contributing something. And uh, if I could ultimately make a living out of it, um, that would be nice. Uh, I, I really came home to Australia. I was going to make this channel. But I had no idea how it would go, and um, but I'd kind of determined that I never wanted to get a, a proper job again. I've had, I've done that, you know, most of my adult life, pretty much since I left university, and I just didn't want to go and put on a pair of pants and a tie and a shirt and go to a place that I didn't really believe in what they were doing. You know, I was just going there to pick up a paycheck. I don't want to do that anymore. I wanted to do something that I actually believe in, and. Um, if you can get paid to do that, that would be uh, ideal. So yeah, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep on going with it and see see what happens. Yeah, and uh, also um, uh, I'm just curious, why do you decide to rename uh, remain anonymous and use an avatar? 
Yeah, I mean, I think in the beginning, um, when you were seeing these other channels, a lot of them, you know, it's like this. This was, I think, I saw. I mean, Sargon was anonymous for a while. Yeah. Before he act, before he actually um, started showing himself on camera and things, and there's a lot of people like that. And part of it was I thought I needed to come up with some sort of catchy avatar that people could relate to or something, right? Um, so that wasn't having the avatars got nothing to really to do with the anonymity. The anonymity was just that in talking to people, they were sort of saying, "Look, you probably want to protect, just protect yourself," because. You're talking about controversial subjects. I mean, if I was my, if I was if my channel was about cat videos or something sort of innocuous how-to videos, then I wouldn't care about anonymity. But um, given the the topics that I talk about, it's just more of a safe than sorry. And I, I do think eventually I'll probably um, unmask myself if yeah. you like sooner or later. I mean, it'll happen. I just. Um, yeah, I haven't got round to it yet. I feel like maybe if there's a critical mass, maybe I get to twenty five thousand or even fifty thousand subscribers, maybe I will. Um, but yeah, I mean the choice of avatar is just um, I I wanted to be because I do try and inject some comedy in my videos. I do some animated stuff every now and then. Yeah, we've and seen uh, that. um, so the avatar is supposed to be he's kind of independent man he's like a superhero but he has no powers and that's why he's kind of dressed as a camp 70s uh, star trek character right and so i'm trying what i'm trying to say is i'm trying not to take myself too seriously you know even though we talk about serious stuff it's yeah. a little bit campy it's a little bit fun so um that yeah that's it independent man he's got no superpowers except his uh, powers of argument that's about it. So, um, so talking about serious stuff, like we have talked about, well, you did mention feminism mm. and how you know, it's turned basically into some man-hating, free speech-hating movement. Mm. So can you tell us what you think about it and if it actually can be stopped and how it can be stopped? Uh, well, I think, I, I think that um, what's happened in the last sort of, two to three decades is that feminism and this is more generally sort of socialist Marxist thought has penetrated yeah. our university system and our government system. Um, so for example, social services, health services, you know, a lot of it, that stuff is run by people who would call themselves feminists. There's lots of um, lesbians in there running this stuff and they've gradually infiltrated. And I, I say this, I don't know if you guys have heard my uh, interview I had with a guy called Mark Dignam. He's a um, Australian uh, who has been involved in the domestic violence industry since the early 70s, and he's noticed he's noticed this change. It's well worth listening to if you go listen to that. And he's noticed this change that all the way through. And not only that, he's been at university in academia, so he's also seen it in academia. Yeah, and that's a problem. It's infiltrated everywhere. So. It has. I, I think it is, and look look at the amount of funding, the amount of women's organisations, like the Gender Equality Agency and all these agencies that are publicly funded, all the domestic violence agencies. This is a massive, massive industry, and um, I think they are going to defend it vehemently. Um, and so what do I think of it? Um, I think it has turned into man-hating. I mean, you'll get this ridiculous notion that, well, if you're for equality, you're for a feminist because that's yeah, what feminism yeah. is about. I mean, it, it's so – I mean, this is just such a canard now. I mean, it's so obvious. I mean, look at look at these idiots trying to ban – not only ban Cassie J's film, they're trying to ban Cassie J from coming to the country now. They've started a petition in the last couple of days. This is how absurd they are, how yeah. un unbelievably absurd. So if you're for equality, feminists, I mean – you, you wouldn't care about this movie. You, you would say, okay, you know, we, we're going to listen to a uh, movie about men's rights and listen to what their arguments are because we are for equality and we want to see if this is legitimate. No, that's not what you're getting at all. That is not the, uh, that's the, not the message they're sending. It's not for equality. We have to stop even giving them that, um, uh, that excuse because it, it's not. I mean, everything they do is not for equality. I mean, I think maybe one of the cases in point is 
look at domestic violence. Now we hear this. One woman a week is killed by a partner in Australia. And our politicians blindly just mouth this off. One woman a week is killed by an intimate partner every week. Now, of course, that's awful. But 14 women are committing suicide in this country every week. 14. Okay. Now, why don't feminists talk about that much? Well, I'll tell you why. Because if they had, if they acknowledge that fourteen women are killing themselves every week, they'd have to acknowledge that forty-four men are killing yeah. themselves every week. And so, you, of course, they're going to pick the topic um, where they are the majority victims. Within domestic violence, women are the majority of victims. Although, they would tell you that women are all victims. They completely ignore uh, male. Um, victims they pretend that it's uh, all male to it, it's all one way by uh, unidirectional and it isn't and um, they also you know and they, and they say it's protect women and their children well you know actually if you look at the statistics women, uh, you know a child death infanticide is more likely to be committed committed by the biological mother than anyone so children are more at risk with their mothers than they are with uh, fathers so, but they've got control of the narrative. I mean, if, you, if you're not following this stuff, you would actually believe that domestic violence is all about men beating the shit out of women and, um, and their children. And it just isn't. It's just a falsehood. And they've been getting away with it. And also the thing is, um, when they're attacking men, they've sort of infiltrated our education system. And we see things like respectful relationships in Victoria, yeah. where they teach about yeah. the wage gap and male privilege and everything. Um, so again, what are, your thoughts, what are your thoughts on that particular issue, respectful relationships, and what yeah. can we do to stop it? Well, I mean, here's, here's the thing. I mean, uh, all I can do and all, of, all I will be doing is just putting out more information about this because the idea behind respectful relationships is to um, stop violence against women. Now, how are you going to do this? Well, they're trying to change attitudes. Now, if, if you know anything about intimate partner violence, is that um, the, the, the major risk factors for intimate partner violence, sexism is not one of them. Yeah. It, and disrespect exactly, is not exactly one of them. Exactly with behaviours and attempting to control people rather than just masculinity in general. No, but I mean, I, I go deeper than that. I mean, the, here's the major risk factors for um, domestic violence. It's poverty. It's unemployment. It's it, the, these people who have sort of, lost direction in their lives they don't have a job they're poor they live in poor areas high crime rates um a lot of alcohol was a big one drug use alcohol use i mean but poverty is um actually the the leading indicator mark latham said this recently said if you want to if you want to wage a war on domestic violence wage a war on poverty because that's where it is i mean and and how much more obvious do you need with the level of domestic violence in Aboriginal communities yeah. because they are the poorest people in Australia and they have the highest rates of domestic violence. So just as a guide, for every domestic violence incident in a middle-class neighbourhood, there are 10 in a public housing estate and 25 in a remote Indigenous community. So, But the narrative is that domestic violence is widespread across our country, it's everywhere. Well, it really isn't. It really the, is not. The, the feminists... Yeah, they they say that oh no, it's a general man problem, and that's why they they push push programs like respectful relationships because they're using it as, as an excuse to sort of uh, you know remake men in the feminist image. Yeah, and I mean it, it's so weird. I I think it's I think a lot of it's punitive. Um, I don't because here's the thing. I mean, your average woman out there. Because uh, and this is another fantastic trick of feminists is that they have kind of convinced people that they speak for women. They don't. They're a small minority, but they push the the narrative, and you can see why men, some men, get resentful of women. Although, you know, they really most women, if you ask them, aren't on board with a lot of this kind of stuff. Um, but they, they they've convinced. Um, I've lost. Oh fuck! I've lost my train of thought now. What was I going to say? Um, Everyday women. Yeah, I mean, most most women are, are not on board with these things. And when you, you highlight to them um, things in the respectful relationships, like, do you agree with this? I mean, 
you know, boys have to stand up the front of the classroom and pledge not to hit girls and be respectful. I mean, this is horrible. It's it's punitive. It's oh, that's what I was going to say is that um, women don't want subservient, servile men. I mean, they don't. Yeah. They, that, and this is another part of feminism that just denies biology and evolutionary psychology. That most women want a man to lead, to take charge, not all the time, but, you know, like, if you're, you know, I'll just give you a tip to guys out there. If you ask a girl out and she goes, oh, yeah, where are we going? And you go, oh, I don't know. Um, I don't know. I haven't really thought of it. Look, women don't like that. You know, they're like a guy who says, yeah, look, there's a new restaurant down there. I'd like to go, and uh, they've got this new stuff on the menu. Let's go. What do you think? Let's go try that out. You know, they 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 like that. All right. Now, a lot of feminists will say that this is wrong and that it's a fifty-fifty thing, but it's it's you're denying biology. There are certain roles that men and women have traditionally played, and will continue to play. And that doesn't mean. Every relationship is going to be the same. Some women are more assertive, and some and some men are less assertive. I'm not saying you have to be this way, but there's just a complete denial of biology of gender roles. They think it's all socially constructed, and that's why they want to do things like in kindergarten they want to tell boys and girls that there's no such thing as boys and girls, and that we're all the same. I mean, we had like because he mentioned that most women aren't don't support this. And we had in Sweden, for example, I saw in your video where it was a minister who said this isn't a gendered issue. Was it yes. a women's party yeah. or something? I mean, she's a feminist. And she's finally come out and said this tired old, you know, canard that this that domestic violence is a gendered issue. We know it isn't. It isn't a, it isn't a gendered issue. Um, I mean, the statistics on this are astounding. Most people won't believe it. But Something like 58% of domestic violence is bi-directional, which means it's men and women having a go at each other. And remember, domestic violence is not necessarily hitting. It's just yelling, right? Um, that's bi-directional, both having a go at each other. Now, when it comes to unidirectional, the rest, the other 43% or 42%, most of that, two-thirds of that, is women to men, all right? Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this is you can go and check this out yourself. This is the database that has collected seventeen hundred peer reviewed articles um, on domestic violence. I mean, it's the best source out there on the internet, and for some reason, we just uh, we just completely ignore it. Now, of course, women um, are always more likely to be victims in terms of injuries of domestic violence. Men hit hard; they're more aggressive. They, um, you know. They're going to cause more injuries than women. They're stronger. Um, so there's that. But the idea that this is this is men disrespecting women is ridiculous. And I'll give you another piece of this. In Australia, we're trying to address attitudes. Now, that idiot, uh, I think his name is Michael Flood, who fronts White Ribbon. He's a professor somewhere in some university. His own studies show that Attitudes to violence, um, women's attitudes towards violence to men are worse than men's attitudes to violence towards women. And they set up this survey. They interviewed uh, a couple of about 5,000 young people. And they asked some questions like, is it okay to hit your partner if they, um, you know, yell at you? Is it okay to hit your partner if they throw something at you? Now, those responses to those questions now most people said no it's not okay but more women think it's okay to hit a male than males think it's okay to hit a female so this idea that we're addressing attitudes females have worse attitudes towards violence than men in this country and you wouldn't know that unless you go and read that report and you go i think it's on page 66 of 150 page report it's in my videos but people don't know this so the the idea that we need to change attitudes is not based in any kind of fact. There's no evidence that changing attitudes will do anything. And we know it's not a major risk factor for domestic violence. It's a complete waste of time and money. It is. Yeah. It, it, it is a waste, yeah. Um, uh, we've got, uh, we'll move on to some of the, the other topics we, we want to ask you about now. So obviously Black Lives Matter in America is causing significant uh, social unrest uh, yeah. uh, there. 
um, and you've uh, done a video on that. But I also feel, um, and I wonder if, if you see this as well, that uh, left-wing activists are trying to import it here using uh, Indigenous issues as a landing pad. I mean... Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so obvious, uh, this grievance culture. And this, um, I mean, the only way, I'm allowed to swear on this podcast, am I? Um, prefer not to, yeah. Prefer not to. <laughs> well, it, it, is, it is basically the, the, the underlying thing is you, you hear people have imbibed this idea now of white supremacy. We live in a white supremacist yeah. world. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's so absurd. Oh, really, white supremacist... Uh, world where um, a black man is president of the United States, where he had two black attorney generals, um, you know, numerous police chiefs around the country are black. I mean, this this idea that we live in a white supremacist, I mean, if it was white supremacist, I mean, it'd be pretty awful for minorities, but um, it's not. And most of the problems in Australian indigenous communities is unknown. Um, we've thrown welfare at people and not required them to do anything to get it. And so that doesn't incentivize anybody. I mean, for a start, you have to acknowledge the injustices done to Aboriginal people. There obviously was. But the way you remedy that um, is not by just throwing welfare at them and uh, not requiring them to do anything. And so they've yeah. absolutely cottoned on to this grievance culture and that, that they're owed something. And, and this has worked its way into now what's called the... Um, uh, the recognition movement, which to me is just another uh, tokenism. It's it's virtue signalling. You tell me how getting recognised in the in the con in the constitution is going to help indigenous communities battle domestic violence, juvenile delinquency. How is that going to help? Um, and it's, yeah, it's a non-issue. Yeah, uh, and yeah. it's also the fact that um, yeah, politicians are too scared to actually say there's something wrong with. Indigenous culture and Indigenous communities because they're scared mm. of, you know, being called, you know, racist or, you know, you're trying to destroy Aboriginal culture. Yeah. Except Pauline. <laughs> yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's, it's just so toxic to, I mean, look at Bill Leake is now in front of the Human Rights Commission under 18C because he drew a cartoon which was extremely powerful cartoon. I mean, you guys know about that incident? Yeah, where yeah. I saw that, uh, yeah. Under the Racial I mean, Discrimination Act. Yeah, um, it's absurd. I mean, he's he's put his finger on the problem. And this is what is so disgusting about the left, is they will virtue signal all about, oh, you you know, you're racist because you even bring it up. You, I'm, you're the real racist because you don't want to do anything about it. Because I think there's a, there's a, part, there's a portion of the left that... I don't believe we live in a racist society. There's racism, of course, but we're not overtly racism. We're not overtly homophobic. We're not overtly um, anti... We're, we're, Australia is a pretty welcoming country. Um, but the left has a demand and supply, a supply problem, whereas they, ha they don't actually have a good supply of racists and homophobes, and so they have to invent them. I think they like to keep them around. Yeah, well, it does sort of complement their stra strategy. I mean, they need they need to like have racists to sort of keep complaining and mm. make it make, make it look really bad and just waste everyone else's time. Yeah, I mean, most most people look. Most people go about their day. Most you know, most Australians are like they're willing yeah, pretty, to pretty give. I mean, you know, yeah, they yeah. They're, they're not going to um, you know not talk to somebody because of a a, a characteristic of them. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, and, and the idea that um, what we see, that we're all told that because there's some trepidation around Muslims, you know, in that recent poll that said 49% of Australians would support a ban on Muslim immigration, that this, that our politicians tell us, is because we're all xenophobic uh, ignoramuses and we don't understand Islam. I mean, it's so patronising and condescending and is exactly why you have the rise of Pauline Hanson and exactly why you have the rise of Donald Trump. Exactly, that's, that's yeah. so true. Um, so you mentioned Islam there. Do you think that Islam does pose uh, a threat to, in Western societies? Oh, absolutely. I mean, look at um, Sweden is now the rape capital of Europe. Yeah. That, 
that that didn't happen because Swedish men just decided to go on a rape rampage. Um, there, there's a reason for that. There's a reason why, um, you know, there's a massive crime rate in uh, Berlin and Paris and other large cities that have just let, um, you know, un, unrestricted sort of influx of migrants. And now they have to fess up and say, oh, yeah, we've got probably 10,000 uh, ISIS well, not, not ISIS followers, but sort of jihadis roaming around the country somewhere. We don't even know where they are, you know. I mean, it, it's, it, to me, it's cultural suicide. I think um, uh, Germany's a special case because they have this history where they generations are just ashamed of who they are because of Hitler. I think they've got to get over that. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the ordinary citizens in Germany are starting to wake up. The, the, po the politicians aren't. Yeah, the ordinary citizens are. I mean, look, look at the. Um, I think it was in Bavaria recently. The, the Antifa was it? Is it Antifa? Oh, no, I forget the what the name. Alternative for Germany, AFD. The, yes, yeah. that's, that's the one. Alternative for Germany, AF. G yeah, whatever it is, AFD. Right. So they they never ran a candidate in Bavaria, and then they run one. They got something like twenty eight percent of the vote, and Merkel's getting smashed in these elections. I mean, th there's a, you know, and it's it's partly to do with Brexit as well. Um, politicians have been ignorant. They talk down to their people. People complain. They call them racists and xenophobes and all the rest. It, it, it's not true. I mean, you can't just say that Australians are um, afraid of what they don't know about Mus Muslims because you, you only have to switch on the news. I mean, the suicide bombing community comes from one faith. This is not... You know, this, you can't point to other areas of the world and say, well, they do it over there too. No, there's, there's, there's only there. one, yeah, there's only one yeah. faith that says and, te and teaches like that this is the ultimate sacrifice that you could make. Right? Yeah. And I think what they would, they would like you to believe is that this um, extremism is some warped uh, reading of the Quran. It isn't. Have you read the Quran? It's, it, it, this is a direct reading. It's literal. Every time ISIS does a beheading video, 15 minutes they do before is to read the verses that they get their justification for. I mean, this is not – you don't have Christians around the world standing there with a Bible citing verses of why they're killing people. It just doesn't happen. This is a – this is a, a – I'm not the first person to say it. It's a, it's a religion that has not had its reformation. It's not had some sort of – it has not been dragged kicking and streaming into the mod modern era like Christianity has. Uh, and uh, that's, that's, that's where the clash of civilizations is. And to pretend, even in Australia, you want to talk about modern Muslims, but it, it, look, they, they, they are disproportionately um, seek welfare. We know there are Sharia courts in operation. We now got stories the other day about how many child brides have been sent over to Pakistan and married and brought back. I mean, there's just, they do this. They come into a country, they occupy it, and they don't um, really try to integrate. And then they want to turn around and tell us that it's our fault. I mean, Australia is a very welcoming place. And that's the thing about having, the thing about multiculturalism and pluralism, which I draw a distinction, which is multiculturalism sort of says, yeah, come in, everybody's welcome, and you can do whatever you like. And pluralism sort of says, yes, you can come here. Yes, you're welcome here, but there are certain values you must adhere to. I like that one more. Yeah. And yeah. 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 And it's also like uh, the reason why you know that you know Islam's different is because you know look how well um, Asians and Indians have integrated into yeah. uh, Australian society, and that's that's how you know that you know there's something about Islam that's you know not mm. not allowing them to assimilate properly, and it's also yeah. you know they. It's not the, as you said, the fear of the unknown. It's the, This is what I call the thin air argument that we just decided mm. one day to not like Muslims. No, it's because we're seeing all these terrorist attacks in the in the, in the the Western world and also the fact that um, yeah, um, Islam doesn't, you know, treat women well or treat gays well mm. and, you know, is quite anti-freedom. Yeah, and, and the, the left act like useful idiots because they're so quick to jump down the throat of say, uh, Christians who want to preserve marriage as just between a man and a woman. They, they, they're they all over that. You know, they they will lambast. They, I mean, what did they do in Sydney recently? They shut down a meeting because people yeah, didn't meet it. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, yet, yet, most the muftis in mosques are preaching every day that you know homosexuality is basically a sin and all the rest of it. It's disgusting. I mean, surveys show that most Muslims don't approve of a gay lifestyle, and that's even in um, in, in in secular countries like ours. They don't approve of it. I mean, if you want to have a look at a group that's homophobic and discriminatory against women, look, Muslims, you don't have to go any further than that. And since we are on the topic, we would like to know what your position on LGBT issues are and what's your focus. So what's your views on transgenderism and same-sex marriage? Um, uh, I'm kind of politically a libertarian. So if you want to do something and it doesn't interfere with my freedom, I really don't care. So I don't get why gay marriage is a problem. Like, I don't see how that affects me as a straight person. Like, why? Now, I, I, I understand there's an argument, look, it's a traditional thing between a man and woman, fine. But two guys getting married doesn't affect my freedom in any way, doesn't impinge on my rights, um, except when you have those cases like you had in the United States, in Oregon, where two lesbians wanted someone to bake them a cake. The baker said, yes. look, we don't do that. And so then they sued them and they won uh, $300,000 or something like that. Now, that that's a problem. And that would be the only reason I would vote against it. I mean, I think what I, th I think in our society, you should have the right to be a bigot. I don't support homophobia, but I, but I support your right to do that because I don't think we need laws for that. I think what we need, all you need is, look, if some baker doesn't want to bake you a cake, those lesbians go and tell their friends who tell their friends and then it gets on Facebook and they say, don't go to this bakery because they're homophobic. Yeah. And pretty and, and most straight people are also going to join that boycott and that business is going to get crushed. And yeah. that that is the way to respond to it, not with punitive because when you when you respond with punitive legislation that punishes people for their beliefs, even if those beliefs are shitty, and I believe that being homophobic is shitty, then you just drive them underground and you cause resentment. Yeah, and you turn them into heroes as well in the, the eyes of their supporters. Yeah, it, 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 but that's the direction of our country. That's the direction of this left, socialist leftist wants to push. Um, you know, it, everything's punitive. You, they want to shut people up. They don't want to have discussions. I would rather it all be out in the public square so people can see what people believe and you can attack arguments in a constructive way and say, look, let's dismantle this line by line. This is why it's wrong. Um, as When it goes to transgenders, again, I don't have a problem with adults doing whatever they want with their body as long as I don't have to pay for it with my taxes. You know, it shouldn't. if you want to get your dick cut off, I don't think that should be covered by Medicare. I don't think people should have to subsidize it. But um, my problem with transgenderism is the brainwashing of children. Um, that uh, we, we say to kids that when they're really, really young, look, there's no such thing as boy and girl. It's all socially constructed and it's, yeah. you know... Which is the, the, boy... the safe school program. Uh, yeah. Says. Yes. So I, I, that's, I'm against that. I think it's, it's about kids. I don't understand. Look, when I was a kid, schools didn't interfere with this. When you got into grade six um, in elementary school, what do we call it here, primary school, um, when you got into grade six, there was a like, sex education class. And all it was was one film once a year for an hour, and it just basically told you where babies came from. And when yeah. you're in gra grade six, you you knew that it all kind of already. Most people kind of knew it. it was, and you sat there and you kind of giggled through the through the film, and it was a bit funny. And you went and and your your parents came with you. It was after school, it was like six o'clock in the evening, and your parents came with you. And you didn't have to come; it was voluntary. I mean, that's all you got. That's all you got. And then, of course, when you get to high school, you had health class, but you didn't have any of this. Hey, imagine you're Cindy and you're 14 and, and you're bisexual and you've had eight partners. And yeah, <laughs> there's none of that. I yeah, mean, yeah. Why, why are we so frightened of letting kids um, just just figure it out for themselves? Yeah. You know, yeah. That's, we, yeah if, a, if a child is you know gay or transgender, they, they can they can figure it out by by themselves. I mean, um, you know, they don't yeah. need to be pushed uh, in a in a certain direction by um, you know, the, these, these people who design the programs. Yeah, I mean, anti, everyone's, everyone can get on board anti-bullying and that's why they use anti-bullying as a shield for what they're, for their, you know, their, um, 
there's societal uh, reconstruction, you know, they, they say, oh, it's about anti-bullying. Well, it isn't really. And Ros Ward's been caught out about this. I mean, she's there's a presentation of her giving a presentation saying, you know, we're trying to produce a, a generation of activists. Exactly. Um, it, it's, it's not about bullying. Yeah, it's not about bullying at all. But, but, you know, parents, I mean, what are parents to do? They, oh, yeah, I'm on board with the anti-bullying thing. Sure, you know, I'll get on board with that. Why wouldn't I? But, I mean, all you need is, okay, look, guys, if, if you know, black, white, religion, whatever, um, look, if Timmy wants to come to school in a dress, don't bully him, all right? We're done here. That's it. Everybody's yeah. the same. Everybody's equal. Um, don't bully. That's all. But, no. That that's all that's all you need for anti bullying. But yeah, you know, we yeah, have I totally agree. Something more something simple. But um we, we we do have to move on to the next topic and that's about Trump and Hillary. Mm, um, five weeks ago. So we yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um we want to know so what what's your attitude towards the US election right now? Who do you, do you support anyone? If you do, who mm. do you support? Um, so, yeah, tell us more about what you think about this, this situation. Well, I think the Americans have uh, uh, something that we don't have in our system, and that is the uh, the right not to vote. And I think if I were an American, I would probably exercise that right. Um, <laughs> and this has got me a lot of trouble because apparently there's certain – this is the problem with echo chambers. People just assume that if you are anti-SJW, then you must be for Trump. Yeah, and, of course – there is some some truth to that, and I do think Hillary Clinton is absolutely awful. I mean, I think these are the two worst candidates in presidential history, and I'm talking about post World War II because I'm I don't have the knowledge of the history back before that. But um, these are the two worst candidates in modern history. So I, my view is that if you're voting for Trump because you think Hillary's awful and because you think she needs to be stopped, and, you, and this creeping authoritarianism needs to be stopped, I totally get it. I wouldn't tell you to do otherwise, but just make sure you understand what you're getting with Trump because Trump is not, uh, you know, he's going to make America great again and bring back jobs. He isn't. His policies on economics are poor. I mean, he came out the other day and said that he would, if any American manufacturer tried to leave the United States, he'd call them up and say, I'm going to put a 35% tariff on your imports. That's, that's economic suicide. We've done that before. I mean, during the Great Depression, they introduced the uh, Smoot-Hawley tax, which crippled the economy, made the, the Great Depression much worse. I mean, that kind of protectionism is is ridiculous. It, it, people could say he's a businessman, he knows what he's doing. Well, that just defies all of that. That, that that's ridiculous policy. That's something you'd that's something you'd expect from Bernie Sanders. That type of policy. And that's just one issue. Then all the other issues, like you know, abortion. He was he was pro-abortion up until about five minutes ago, and then he wanted to punish women. Now he doesn't want to punish women. Now he, you know, he's pro-life, but he's, you know, it's oh, we got to leave it to the states to decide. He's all over the map. He's someone who hasn't thought deeply about many issues, with probably the exception of immigration. Um, so he's not a good candidate. And I and I'll continue to say, okay, vote for him if you want to stop Hillary. I get it, but um, just. Know what you're getting in return. My my position is that if Hillary wins, which is still the most likely outcome, she will be so awful, she'll be so mired in scandal that this could really be a better opportunity for a better candidate to come in and just smash the Democrats um, into oblivion. And, you know, because you need, in Australia, we need this everywhere. We need, we need a, not necessarily conservative, all around, but you need a, at least a fiscal conservative government. Forget the social issues. You could leave those to the side. A fiscally conservative government that's interested in cutting back on what government does, cutting taxes, cutting welfare benefits, cutting back, stopping the advance of this socialist fucking super state. Sorry. But... Um, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> we we, we yeah. understand. We understand. Um, because, you know, Hillary is... She seems to have her socialist agenda, and you know she she seems to be intent on starting a world war with Russia, um, with her no-fly zone. To be fair, you said you said that Trump was um, he said he wanted to punish women. The thing is, he clarified saying that he wanted to punish the people who do the, the actual doctors or the clinics who carry out. Well, abortions. he did say that afterwards. 
he did say that after it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> he, he, again, it, it's just a, it's whether I I don't think he believes any of those things. I think he's he's kind of making it up on the fly because again, I don't think he's actually really thought through what he believes on a lot of these issues, and that's evident when he talks about it. And I and I kind of laugh as well as how Trump supporters now think that Vladimir Putin is the sort of the the most honest person in the world because Vladimir Putin comes out and says, well, look, if you elect Trump, we have a chance of working with each other. But if you elect Hillary, it's going to be World War Three. And so all of a sudden now, whatever Vladimir Putin says can be taken as gospel. I don't know when this happened, that Vladimir Putin became the most honorable person in the world, that we should believe whatever comes out of his mouth. I don't think he has a track record for that. So, yeah, I, I get that. Yeah, yeah. because Putin isn't exactly the best person. Um, yeah. I think he's he's good in some ways. I think because he is um, against things like refugee intake. Um, he has acknowledged how Europe is getting really bad um, mm. with the refugees. So I think he has a good side. It's just he's not as good as many people sort of think of him to be. Well, it's just it's, he's not trustworthy. I mean, you, you know, he does he doesn't have a great track record on keeping his word. Um, so he hasn't got the best track record on human rights. I mean, being gay in Russia is not. Yeah. exactly easy i don't think so there's a i think there's a lot of i think the public debate in youtube circles and generally is is just as toxic as the actual debate between those two because those two it just it's i mean truth has gone out the window in this campaign yeah. it's all about slander and just disparaging the other and they're both deeply deeply unpopular candidates but i have to say trump has come in from a seven point deficit two weeks ago to three just over three points now. And that's almost in the margin of error. I mean, he was, he yeah. was two weeks ago, he was gone. It was over. And it was just about how bad it's going to be. Uh, and the fact that he's in there with a chance now, it's, uh, it's really interesting. Uh, it's going to be interesting how it, how it eventually plays out. And yeah, I agree. I don't know what, I don't know what sort of president Trump, Trump would make, whether he'd be good or, or bad, but I do like, you know, what he's done to the political system, just, uh, mm. you know, te te tearing it all down and also, um, you know, shredding political correctness in the in the process. So yeah, even though I'm not, you know, a hundred hundred percent gang ho, I certainly think that, you know, he, he's you know pr provided some some value. Oh yeah, I mean that the the whole idea it's refreshing for someone to come in, not not be taking you know millions of dollars from Wall Street, not be taking millions of dollars from people all around the world, you know, you, you can say that this guy's, um, he's clean in some sense. Now he's got some dodgy um, sort of things in his background with his business dealings, but I mean, this guy's not beholden to interests and he's free to say what he says and, and he criticizes and the media are stacked against him and, he, and he's not scared to criticize him. He goes at them and the media, and the media's horrible. Media is absolutely horrible, and they're unbelievably biased. That's a, that's a separate issue altogether, yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. But it'll, it'll all be really interesting on November the 8th or November the 9th in Australia. Um, that's when the election happens. But that's all we have time today, Indy. Yeah. Um, thanks for coming. It was, yes, thank it you was so really, much. It was, really, it was really amazing conversation we had, um, very meaningful as well. Everyone, please check out Indy's channel, Independent Man. We will provide a link on the video show notes, so the, on the podcast show notes. And um, yeah, and today's podcast is available on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, um, and now we have our own YouTube channel. So you can listen to us on any preferred platform you want, um, on the go, anywhere you want. Um, thanks again, Indy, so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks, guys. It's good. Um, and we, we'll see you later. Yeah, we'll yep. see you next Tuesday for our review show, and then we'll have yes. another interview show next Thursday. Next Thursday, yep. Okay, thanks. Bye. Thanks, guys.